Well, good night and welcome to Calvary Chapel this evening. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, again, we thank you so much that this week we celebrate our salvation. The week that we celebrate you going to a cross and shedding your blood for our sin and coming out of that grave. Our prayer is that, Lord, that you, the gospel message will go out and reach people that desperately need you, Lord. We think of those in St. Bible and on this peninsula, Lord, we pray that uh, some way, Lord, you would reach them this week and they could enter into eternity and be with us, Lord. And if there's any way you can use us, then use us for that. But be glorified this week, be glorified tonight as we worship you, and Lord, we look forward to what you have to say to us through your word, minister to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
not just in song, Lord, but every day that we would serve you, worship you, for you are the most holy one. You are the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords, and deserving that our lives would be laid down before you. You are so good to us. Now, Lord, speak, minister, Holy Spirit, speak the word of God into our hearts, into our lives. Change us and make us more like Jesus tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you need a Bible to follow along with this evening, uh, just raise your hand and Mr. Aaron will bring you one. Hi, Mr. Steve Brady. I get to see who's watching when I go up to the thing there. Uh, one announcement I, I do have to make, because I, I, I'm going to forget if it's on my mind right now, so I need to do it. So Friday night, because it's Good Friday, there will be no youth meetings. We don't have them on Good Friday. Good Friday is a special night for people in Belize. Well, it's a special night for all of us. So no youth meetings on Friday night. And also I got a call from someone today that they w want to uh, do an addition to Mr. Martin's house and put a septic tank in. And they're going to pay for it. Uh, if there's any, but they want to know if there's anybody who would, who would like to help uh, with the construction of that, a day here, a day there, or whatever. Anybody wants to help in that, you know, talk to me later and, and I will uh, arrange. I don't know when they're going to do it or anything, but... That's, I want to throw that out there because I told him I would ask. So I did my duty to God and that person. Exodus chapter 20, verse 17. The Tenth Commandment. As we know, the Lord gave us the Ten Commandments. You know, a guideline of how to live this life and how to live it rightly and righteously. But he also gave it to us to show us that we could not follow them. We break the Ten Commandments consistently, every one of us. And it shows us that we have a need for a Savior. Because if you break one of the commandments, I mean, you're, you have to pay the penalty of that. And it's sin when you break a commandment. And the penalty of that is you're going to go to hell. So we need someone to pay that penalty for us, and that's Jesus. And that's what we celebrate this week. He went to the cross and shed his blood on that cross so that we can be forgiven for all the commandments we've broken and all the sin that we've done or going to do. And he rose from the dead and sealed the deal. So the Tenth Commandment says this, You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. You shall not covet. Covet means to desire, to lust after. Delight in something somebody else has. You know, this commandment, again, is not usually taken as seriously as, you know, the ones like do not murder, or do not steal, things like that. Because, you know, they have the consequences with those. But it's just as serious to break this commandment as any commandment. So what is coveting? Wanting more of what you already have enough of, more than likely. More and more and more. Just wanting more. Wanting what other people have. 
You know, our economy here in Belize and in the United States is stimulated by coveting. They spend billions of dollars on commercials on TV to make you covet after things. I mean, you can't have a regular pair of tennis shoes. You've got to have Nike. You've got to have the Nike. Air Jordan. That's right. You know, and you can, you can get the same tennis shoe for, you know, $100 less somewhere else, but it's got, it doesn't have Air Jordan on it. It's called Feeding Our Greed. Feed Our Greed. That's what advertising does. It stimulates our greed. It gets you to buy more. You know, trying to buy things that we don't need with money that we don't have to impress people we don't even like. Covening. You know, and a greedy person is not a happy person. They're not happy. They always want more. Because they're not happy with the things that they have. They want what their neighbor has. They want to make sure they have more than their neighbor, usually. It's about competition. A little bigger, a little better, and just a little bit faster. I remember when I was a kid, you know, and I wanted my car to beat your car. And I would do whatever I could to make my car beat your car. And if my car couldn't beat your car, well, I wanted your car. There's these, how you say, Aesop's fables, these stories, you know, they always had a twist in these stories, and one of them was about a man was told he could have whatever he wanted under one condition, and that condition was that his neighbor would get twice as much. You can have whatever you want, but under condition your neighbor gets twice as much. So this guy says, well, give me a mansion, and so... He got a mansion. Well, his neighbor got a castle. And he saw that, and it kind of gnawed at him. It kind of bothered him. Well, I only got a mansion. He got a castle. He asked for ten servants, and his neighbor got twenty servants. That bothered him even more. He asked for fifty cows, and his neighbor got a hundred cows. It was just eating at him, because his neighbor got more. Like, he, he had plenty for himself. He had more than enough. And he got, he just, it went on and on and on, and then he got furious that his neighbor always got more. He was so upset, so finally he said, he asked, he asked for one of his eyes to be poked out. So his neighbors, we get both his poked out, right? I mean, get it? I want one of my eyes to be poked out, because he didn't want that guy, he wanted to bring that guy down. He had plenty, he had more than enough. That's the problem with coveting, greediness. We get jealous of what they have. You know, God wants us to be free from slavery because that's slavery. Slavery to sin. Slavery to covetousness. Be content with what you have. You know, in Luke 12, Jesus tells us a story that deals with the issues of this. Luke 12, verse 15. Go ahead and turn there. Jesus speaking to them and he said to them, Luke 12, 15, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. It's not what you have that makes you happy. It's not, that's not your life. That's what it's all about. Life is not found in the things that you have, your stuff. Culture tells us, our cultures, to have a real nice, to have a real nice life, we need to have a better house and a better car, and nicer clothes, and a better job, and more money. Life is not about stuff. We'll get continuing on in that parable in verse 16 of Luke 12. He said, Then he spoke a parable to, the, parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. This rich man, you know, his, his land provided an abundant of crops. You know, what, what would you do if you were rich and he and, and you got more you know i mean that's what it is he, he's got more he's rich and he's he's got more more so he can save it up for the future you know hold your place there in luke 12 we're going back there but t- turn to first timothy chapter 6 that goes along with this first timothy chapter 6 verse 6 says now godliness with contentment is great gain Godliness with, great, with contentment is great gain. To be content, to be satisfied where God has you and what He has in your life. 
because he's in control of our lives and we, we need to understand that. There's ministries out there, Christian ministries supposed to be, telling you you should have all that you want and need. It's the opposite of what Jesus teaches. There is no name it and claim it in God's kingdom. Name it and claim it is not in God's kingdom. Be content, be satisfied. We'll continue on there in 1 Timothy 6 or 7. It says, For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. I've told you guys that story about the guy that had, he was pretty rich, you know, and he was dying. And, you know, he had a, he had an attic and he had a basement in his house and all, all his relatives are there and he's going to die any moment. And so he had taken all his riches and put them up in the attic. So that, you know, when he died, he went up, he'd grab them on the way up. Take them with him when he went to heaven. You know, and all the relatives are there, you know, and they're waiting for him to die. And poof, he goes, he dies. They all run upstairs into the attic and they look. Everything's still there. And his wife says, I told him he should have put it in the basement. You don't take it with you. Having food and clothing, with these we will be content, he says there in verse 8. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Now listen closely. Listen, online, listen, listen. Because this is mis misquoted scripture too much of the time. This is the real scripture, it says... For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Money is not the root of all evil, all kinds of evil. Because there's a lot of evil that has nothing to do with money. For which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Going after money, they mess themselves up and pierce themselves through. They have sorrows and not happiness. Those who live to be rich are not happy. You know, it brings a little happiness here and there. It's kind of like a video game, you know. If you guys have ever played a video game, you know, when you first get to the video game, it's like, oh, yeah, wow, well, do blah, 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 blah. And then, you know, after a while, you get bored. You need another one. So it doesn't make you happy. Temporary. Turn back to Luke 12. Let's finish the story about the rich man. The rich man. Yielded all this. His land produced. Well, in verse 17 it, it says, And he thought to himself, saying, What shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. Listen, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will store all my crops and my goods. Notice it is, I will, I will, I will. It's all about himself. Never, Lord, what is your will? What would you have me do with this excess and this abundance? Lord, you have blessed me. So much. What do you want? What can I do to bless you, Lord? He has his own financial plans, his portfolio in order, you know, his savings accounts and IRAs, all that, all in order. You know, it is not wrong to be blessed with possessions or to be blessed with stuff or to be blessed by being rich. There's nothing wrong with that at all. You just need to be careful. It may be dangerous. What do you do with it? Here's what the Holy Spirit has to say to us in those who are well off. 1 Timothy 6, 17. We're going to get back to Luke 12 again. Now we're back in 1 Timothy 6, 17. It says, Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good that they may be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold of eternal life. Gives those who are well off good instruction there. Enjoy and use your wealth to benefit the kingdom of God, to help others. What is your will, Lord? Well, back to Luke 12. The, he's got all this excess crops and he's going to do this, he's going to do that. So it says in Luke 12, 19, and I will say to my soul, he's got his barns, they're going to build, put all the produce in it. He's set up for life, retirement. I will say to my soul, you have many goods laid up 
for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. I've got it made. I've got, I, I'm, look at man, I've got all, it's all happening. But you know what's interesting how we can make our plans, but God sure changes them. A, a, a story in my life it had nothing to do with being rich, but it had to, you know, it has to do with God's plans in our lives. You know, I, I, I was doing well in my business, and there was one year, uh, my business did good, and the spring's coming up, and, you know, we lived in the snow, and the snow was disappearing, and I just bought a boat that I was going to refurbish, you know, and, and so I could go out fishing in Lake Tahoe during the summer, and I got a golf pass, and I was ready just to enjoy life. I was ready, I, kind of like this guy. And wouldn't you know it, I wake up one day and I'm paralyzed. My plans changed. I never put that boat in the water and I didn't golf a single day that year. God changed all my plans. I probably said, Lord, what do you want me to do with this boat? I, you know, God, had a, God, had, God had another plan. But look at this guy. He thinks he's going to be happy. Hey, take your ease. Eat, drink, and be merry, he says there in Luke 12, 19. Thinks he's, going to, he's got a maid. Well, guess what? Listen to Luke 12, 20. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? You fool. You're storing it all up. You're not taking it with you, man. You're just going to fly right through the attic like that guy. Soup! You are down. I don't know which way he went. He never got to enjoy those things. He was never satisfied. Do not covet because your happiness will never happen in your stuff. The joy is only, your joy and peace only come in the Lord. And then he continues on there in Luke 12, verse 21. The Lord, fin er, the Lord finishes it. So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. When you just build your own kingdom in your own life and it's all about you, you're not rich towards God. You are a fool if that's what you do. That's what the Bible says. You know, that's not me, man. So are we? We're foolish if we live for stuff and covet. Because we never put anything in our bank account in heaven. We haven't used our life for Him and His kingdom. I mean, every, everyone here knows your own life. I don't know your own lives. But have you invested in the kingdom of God in your life? Or is it all about you? What you want? What you're going to do? Or have you invested in God's kingdom? If you haven't, the Bible calls you a fool. Store your treasure in heaven. Then, verse 22. It says, Then he said to his disciples, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, nor about what your body, what you will put on. Life is more than food, and body is more than clothing. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor, re nor reap which have neither storehouse nor barn, and God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? Don't, don't you like that when you really think about that? God takes care of them. He takes care of the, the birds of the air. He feeds them. And they don't, you know, go punch a time clock. He just takes care of them. He feeds them. And you, aren't you worth more to God than the birds? Yes, you are. You're made in His image. In which one of you, in verse 25, by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? You know, worrying does not lengthen your life. As a matter of fact, I, would th I think that science and doctors say it probably even shortens it, does it, Jackie? Worrying could, could shorten your life. S stress? Yeah. If you, then you're not able to do the least, why are you anxious for the rest? Consider the lilies, the flowers, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And I, let I say to you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Man, God clothed the flowers of the field better than anybody's ever been dressed. That's what he's saying here. If then God so clothes the grass, which today is in the field and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, 
How much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? He said, God's going to take care of you, but he's going to show you how in, in, in a few verses. And do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink, nor have an anxious mind. For all these things the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knows you of all these needs. God knows you need food, clothing, and a place to live. He knows that. So why are you anxious? Why are you worried about it? And then he says this, verse 31. But seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. That's out of Matthew 6, 33. This is in Luke here. Seek the kingdom of God. If, you know, people think, i got to get a job. It's going to take care of everything if I get a job. My Bible says, if you seek God and His kingdom and His righteousness, He'll get you the job. Seek after Him, He'll get you the job. That means you're, you don't stay in your house and you don't hide in the bedroom and wait for somebody to come knock on the door and say, i got a job for you. You go out you know, and you look for it, but God will take care of you. He promises that if you seek Him and His kingdom. And I'm telling you, it's the truth. It's the truth. God takes care of us. Seek His kingdom. Is that what we do or do we seek after the world? And then you wonder why you're struggling and why this is happening, why you're living this way and that's all going on. Your, your focus is in the wrong place. You know, I had... I, this dog here, some of you remember my dog Buster. Big Buster. Buster Bear. My big dog. You know, we, before, uh, not too long ago, up where we lived up at Kokomo, we were the only house out there. There was no houses out there. You know, and so we'd just go run out there and, and watch, uh, I'd watch beautiful sunsets. And that buster would go out with me and Shazi. Sometimes we'd go out there and they'd run in the lagoon and swim a little bit and just run. And, and I'd go out there and we'd go out there and we'd watch the sunset go down. It was beautiful. See God's creation. You know what? Buster was running around smelling other dogs' pee and poop. <laughs> he was missed the whole thing. We were enjoying the Lord, and the, the, God, you know, and, and, and His creation, and all this, and He's seeking after the world. I hate to give you that example, but you know that's what it, that's what it's like. If you're seeking after the things of the world, it's like sniffing out dog poop, man. If you're a dog, you miss out on what God has for you. I made that one up. <laughs> my friend, or this pastor, one of my favorite pastors, Pastor John Corson, uh, Calvary Chapel Applegate up in Oregon, uh, he does this study that, oh, I, I love the study. And the first time I heard it, I just thought, wow, is that the truth? And he was talking about the people that, you know, are looking for sin in people's lives. Who's going to sin so you can, you know, you can just whap them and yell at them and, Tell them they're going to hell, and you know, you're just looking for. He called them crotch sniffers, like a dog sniff. You know, you ever watch dogs? They run up to you and they sniff, sniff your butt and your crotch. See, that's what he called them, crotch sniffers, like sniffing out people's sin, like a dog. <laughs> so I got my own. <laughs> you know, we can enjoy the beach, man. We can enjoy sunset, the sand. The, the plants, all for free. You know, you get a pair of goggles and go out and look at God's creation under the, under the sea. I mean, it's incredible. Our, our problem is, is that we go out and see it and we, then we want it. We want to own it. We want to own the beach. You guys know, you see the, the expats and the people that come down here and try to own the beach and not let anybody go, you know, on the beach and... They want the condo on the sea. God says you shall not covet. You have all that you need in Him. You have all that you need in the Lord. You have eternity. Your sin is forgiven. You have new life. An abundant life, if we seek after Him, you have the Lord. You don't have to have your mind on all the stuff all the time. You know, I, I, you know what? 
I enjoy my stuff, you know. I, get, I got an iPhone 11. <laughs> everybody, everybody was 15s and 18s, whatever they are now, is going, you only got 11? Well, I graduated from a 6 to 11, you know. That's because I didn't have to spend $1,500 for it. It was only a couple hundred dollars. But I enjoy it. You know, I enjoy my, my iPad, you know. And to tell you the truth, I mean, my iPad, this iPad here, it's, I use it for the Lord. This, this is my teaching iPad right here. It's, I enjoy it, but I enjoy it for Him. So, and hopefully you get to enjoy it too, because all my studies come right out of it. This, thou shalt not covet, is the last commandment to us. Because it is important for a life filled with God to be filled with contentment. It's important. Be rich in God. Be rich in His kingdom. Be satisfied where He has you. Seek Him first in His righteousness. And just watch what He does in your life. Just, just watch. I mean, that doesn't mean, you know, we're going to you know, go up to the plantation and get one of those houses there in the sea. And, you know, it doesn't, doesn't mean that. That's not contempt. That's coveting. Coveting. If you want one of those. But you'll have what you need, and you'll have peace and joy, and that's way more than stuff, right? So let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your ten commandments. Thank you, Lord, that they show us that we have a need for you and forgiveness of our sin, because it shows us that we are sinners. So we thank you for that. We thank you for you, Jesus, that because of you we have forgiveness of our sin. But at the same time, Lord, we thank you for the Ten Commandments because you give us the rules for life. You show us how to live a godly life. We know what is right and what is wrong and, and, and what to do and what not to do because you've given us the rules. And then, Lord, you give us the Holy Spirit who comes and lives inside us. God Himself, you, by the Holy Spirit, living in us to help lead us and guide us when we submit our will to you. Thank you, Lord. You give us the rules, you give us the forgiveness, and then you give us the victory to walk through this life. Thank you so much. And Lord, whatever we're struggling with, if we're struggling with what we don't have, well, help us to not do that anymore, Lord. That forgive us for that. And we are thankful for what we do have, Lord. And that, and that number one is you. Thank you so much. Now go before us, Lord, and this, the rest of this week we pray that your gospel would go out, you would reach people. We know that most people in the world use this week, Easter, as a time to party. But Lord, we use it as a time of remembrance of what you've done for us, what you've done for the whole world. That's the biggest party of all, Lord. And people think they party here. Wait till we get in heaven. We'll be partying with joy and peace that we can't even imagine, Lord. Be nothing like people think they're partying down here, Lord. We party in you. I pray, Lord, for this week that you will convict people to get into church and they would hear the gospel and maybe turn their life over to you. I, I pray for a saint by here, Lord, that people wake up that day from their whatever they've done the night before and just, Lord, drag them to church so they can hear the truth of who you are, Lord. We just want to see people know you and get saved so they can go to heaven with us. That's in your hands, Lord. We'll do what you've asked us to do and we leave the results in your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, you guys. Well, God bless you. We want the chairs put up. Okay. Mind putting the chairs up. Thanks.